first speaker is really no stranger, I think, to everybody here, but for others who don't know Brother Danny Douglas, he'll be bringing us a study of is it possible to know who is a member of the Lord's Church. Danny is a native of Pleasant, Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, and he's been preaching the gospel on a regular basis since 1977. He served congregations in Tennessee, Kentucky, Ohio, and Virginia. He's done full-time mission work in the Ukraine and in the United Kingdom. He worked in public education for about 10 years. He was a teacher, a principal, and a college instructor. And now he's involved in financial services as his main bread and butter. Is that the way to put it? <laughs> okay. He started preaching the gospel on the radio back in 1982 and continues this work on four radio stations, including a daily broadcast on WNAH in Nashville, Tennessee, and he publishes video sermons weekly on the Internet. He preaches for the Central Church of Christ in Mount Pleasant, Tennessee, along with uh, Brother Rolf Ruffner. He's also involved in the work of the Lord in the Philippines and in the UK. In recent years, he's taught school and is currently working in insurance business. He's blessed with a faithful and dedicated wife and serving Christ, the Arnie Douglas, and they are blessed with two children, Lydia and Daniel Moses. And we're thankful to simply say about Danny, he is a stalwart, faithful, servant of the Lord who knows what it is to sacrifice for the cause of Christ in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. We appreciate his dedication to the Lord and I know we'll benefit from this study of is it possible to know who is a member of the Lord's church. Now we'll hear Brother Danny. Thank you, Brother Brown, for the kind words. I really appreciate Brother and Sister Brown and their hospitality and friendship and faithful service of the Lord. And I'm thankful for all the elders here and their godly wives. And I do appreciate all the faithful members of the Lord's Church here at Spring. And I appreciate the invitation to be with you. And I'm thankful for the prayer that Brother Sandell led and the song that uh, our good brother, Brother Bailey, led a while ago. I appreciate it very much. And thank you, Brother Brown, for the admonition to turn off our cell phones. I actually was guilty of that a few years ago. You may remember that. It was a night service, and I was up here getting ready to speak, and there was a, a good number there that night. And Brother Brown had just told everyone to silence their phones. And all of a sudden, mine went off. And I realized that uh, there was one person that didn't follow directions, and it was me. But I did make sure I turned it off this time. But it is a blessing and a privilege to be here and with these other fine brethren that will speak. I know that with the lineup I've seen, they will all have strong sound scriptural lessons and we love and appreciate all those here and the lord's church at fish hatchery also we're well represented here we're thankful for them and for each and every one of you here today i remember several years ago when i was preaching in the mountains of virginia that uh, we had a man and his wife and his son came into the services one day to visit they were very nice people. It wasn't long, though, to one of our men ask this man to lead prayer and even to preside over the Lord's table. And we did not know much about those people at all. Upon further investigation, we found out that he was a member of a denomination. That could have been known according to what the Bible says and according to what we will look at today. 
Can we know who a true member of the Lord's church is? The true church, indeed we can. For one thing, let us be sure that God knows. He does know. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stand sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. The Lord knoweth them that are his. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 3. If any man love God, the same is known of him. Now who is it that loves God but a faithful member of the Lord's church? That's one who loves God. For Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments, John 14, verse 15. We can know because Jesus said that we can know in the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 7, verse 20, he said, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. That is, not only the false, but who are the true. We can know that by their fruits. You know the tree by the fruit it bears. Today we will consider how we can know what a true member of the Lord's church is. For one thing, we can know because we can know what a Christian is. And that's what a true Christian is, a faithful follower of Christ and a member of the body of Christ, the church. Now, ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular, Paul said, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 27, when he addressed the church of God and the saints at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, as we read, we know that a disciple is a follower, an obedient learner of the Lord. And in Acts eleven twenty six, 26, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And so a Christian is a follower of the Lord, a member of the body of Christ, one who has obeyed the gospel one who is sanctified and therefore become a saint, set apart unto God to his high and holy purposes. In John 17, verse 17, Jesus prayed, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And so when people obey the gospel and they become saved, they become sanctified and saints, and they continue to be in that condition as long as they continue to be obedient to the Lord. Now the word continue is a very important word when it comes to being a member of the church. Jesus said in John 8 31, if ye continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You are truly my disciples if ye continue in my word. In the next verse, and many times we don't quote verse 31 with it, but Jesus said in verse 32, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When? When you continue in my word as a true disciple and follower of the Lord. Now I want to get into a few main points here about is it possible to know who is a member of the Lord's church. First of all, we can distinguish between false brethren and true brethren. If we could not do that, then we could not know who is a true member of the body of Christ. As we look at the wording of Paul in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty six, among many of the trials and challenges and hardships that he faced, one of them was perils among false brethren. False brethren. If there is such a thing as false brethren, then there must be the ability to know who true brethren are. If we can know who false brethren are, then we can know who True brethren are, and indeed we can know the difference between true and false brethren. And therefore we can know who is a member of the body of Christ, the church. We have this ability through the inspired word of God. Now one reason that many congregations, I'm talking about in the brotherhood, and many brethren do not recognize the difference is because they don't know the Word of God, and that's because they don't study the Word of God. It's like two men who were discussing problems in the church, and one said, well, I don't know, and I don't care. Well, that's two of the main problems, ignorance and apathy. I don't know, and I don't care. 
How many members of the church do not read and study their Bibles every day? I could have asked that question of us here today. Do we read and study God's Word? Are we commendable as Luke, inspired of the Spirit of God, commended the Bereans when he said these were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the Word with all readiness of mind and searched the Scriptures daily whether those things were so, Acts 17, verse 11. To be a student of the Word of God is something not to be ashamed of. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Reminds me of a story one time about a lady who heard a preacher preach, and she was very impressed with that preacher and his knowledge of the word of God. And she went up to him, and she said, I would give the world if I knew the Bible like you. And he said, that's exactly what I've had to give. Now, friends, if we're going to know God's word, if we're going to be soul winners, which we'll talk about later today, if we're going to build up the body of Christ, the church, and to be the kind of example and faithful worker that we need to be, we must be fortified and built up by the word of God, which is able to build us up, Acts 20 and verse 32. But God's word gives us the knowledge and the wisdom and the ability to discern between that which is true and that which is false. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, Paul said that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, that is complete, thoroughly furnished unto every good work or unto all good works. Now we know that there are some who say, well, you know, we cannot really uh, understand the Bible alike. Well, friends, if we understand it at all, we understand it alike. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Ephesians 5, 17. Whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3, verse 4. So the problem is not that man cannot understand the Bible. It's because he refuses to work hard enough at it to understand it. And Paul said in 2 Timothy 2, 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman needeth, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The Apostle John evidently understood, and he was an inspired apostle, of course, as all the apostles were inspired of God, recognized that we can know the difference between the true and the false. When he said, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. 1 John 4 and verse 1. Therefore, we can know what a true member of the Lord's church is because we can recognize that which is false. Secondly, we can know who a faithful member of the Lord's church is and what a faithful congregation is because God requires us to be in fellowship only with those who are faithful in the body of Christ. Now, God has never given us a command that we cannot obey. But if we could not recognize the difference between the true and the false and between a sound congregation and one that's not sound or between false brethren and those that are not false, then certainly we would not be able to carry out God's law and fellowship. But we can and we must, as the Bible says. This then is the message that we have heard of him in declaring to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin, 1 John 1, verse 5 to 7. So we can and we must recognize the difference between the faithful and the unfaithful and what a true member is and what a true member is not. God demands, according to Ephesians 5.11, that we have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, Ephesians 5.11. Now I want to ask this question. 
Do we have any unfruitful works of darkness going on among those that claim to be churches of Christ today in the brotherhood? We certainly do. Do we have any of these things going on between members or among individual members of the Lord's church? Certainly we do. What about preachers and elders? Of course we do. Those claiming to be gospel preachers and elders. We have many unfruitful works of darkness being carried on today in the brotherhood. Well, Paul said that we are to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. And that's one thing that I'm thankful for in the spring church of Christ and the lectureships that you always have with the faithful elders here and faithful preachers that you always seek to reprove error. That's important. A lot of brethren today don't want to do that. They don't want to stand against the works of darkness, even if they are religious works that profess to be good works, but they are nonetheless works of darkness if they are not under the authority of Jesus Christ, if they are not in the name of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3, verse 17. Now, my friends, I'd like to go to the book of Revelation, the second chapter, for a few moments to point out that those who claim to be in the body of Christ or claim to be Christians may be in error. Let's go to Revelation chapter 2, verse 2, where Jesus here is addressing the church at Ephesus. He said, here quoting the words of the Lord, the Lord says, I know thy works, and he says that by the way to every one of these congregations. I know thy works. And he knows the works of every congregation today. He said, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Now, we're talking about something that was going on in the church. This is one of the commendable things of the church at Ephesus. They were rebuked for leaving their first love, verses 4 and 5, but nonetheless, they were commended by the Lord for the fact they would not put up with evil and with evil men. Then we go down to verse 6 here, again to the church at Ephesus. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. God hates evil deeds. And we, understand, we need to understand that. Whether they be evil deeds being performed by people in the church or without the church, God still hates these things. The Lord hates these things. And so there were things going on in the church by those called the Nicolaitans, which we really don't know very much about them, but that the Lord hated their works and their teaching. Look at verse number 15. He says to the church at Pergamos, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. You have them there with you, those that hold to the false teaching of the Nicolaitans. So we ask the question, are there unfruitful works of darkness going on today in the brotherhood among those that claim to be the Lord's church and members of the Lord's church? Indeed, there are many examples of this. We have another example to the church at Thyatira, a woman who is called Jezebel. And of course, Jezebel in the Old Testament was infamous. She was a wicked woman, the wife of King Ahab and uh, I believe Jezebel is used here in a figurative sense is my understanding. But figurative or not, she was a wicked woman. Look at what she was doing in the church. Verse number 20. Jesus said, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest. That is, you allow this. You put up to this, with this. Now, I want to pause there for a moment. Today, if a congregation is permitting and allowing Evil to be taught and practiced, is the Lord for that or is he against that? Is he against brethren that are doing that, that are allowing it? Although they themselves may not be directly involved in that false teaching or false practice, yes, he is. 
He said, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest or allow that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. So here is a very obvious example that there is evil and darkness that can happen within the Lord's church, and it often does. Now, I want to go to another example, and this is in the book of Galatians. Here, Paul is addressing the churches of Galatia, Galatians 1 and verse 2. There are many things we could say about this. He warns against those who would bring another gospel besides the gospel of Christ, Galatians 1, 6 to 9. Although they may be bringing many things that are true, if one seeks to add mix the truth with human opinion and error, it ends up being a false gospel. And such a person will be a curse before God if he brings an impure gospel, so to speak, which is not another, Paul said. Here in the churches of Galatia, there were those teachers called Judaizers who were trying to bring converts to Christ back under the old law, the law of Moses, called the law here in the book of Galatians. For example, in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 4, Paul said, Christ is become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law, that is, those who are seeking justification by the law of Moses, because we know it cannot justify he said to them further, you are fallen from grace. So we have at least two false doctrines that can be refuted in that one verse. The idea that we can go back under the law of Moses, and moreover, the idea that we cannot fall from grace. Paul says here, if you do this, you are fallen from grace. But now I want to go down further in Galatians 5. In verse number 9, we read about the little leaven that leaveneth the whole lump. The little leaven that leaveneth the whole lump. It only takes just one or two in the church to leaven the whole lump. And thus it must be corrected. It must be stopped. We read in Galatians 5, verses 7 and 8. And look at verse 7 here. How many times have we seen souls that are described by this? They've come into the church, they're faithful, they're doing well, they're growing in the Lord, but all of a sudden, something or someone turns them in the wrong direction. My friends, we know that happens many times. It's a great warning here. Verse number 7, ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? This persuasion cometh not of him that calleth you. There were those who were doing well in running the Christian race, the Christian course, but something hindered them. Something caused them to change their course. And thus we have the book of Galatians to stop this evil influence and to turn those around who are going in the wrong direction. Now, I'd like to look at in the third place this morning. We can know who is a member of the Lord's church because we can know what a true Christian is and a true congregation is because we can know the difference between mere lip service and that which is love indeed. In 1 John 3.18, Paul said, My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. You know, I think about uh, some of these colleges and preacher schools and brethren that they profess they're still sound in doctrine. We're still alive and well, so to speak. And we're still okay. But yet, they won't stand for the truth in everything. They will not declare the whole counsel of God, Acts 20, verse 27. Kind of reminds me of that old uh, show with Elliot Ness many years ago, The Untouchables. You know, we got some brethren with some issues and some other brethren, they're the untouchables. You don't touch that. 
Just get your hand off that. Although it's wrong and it's sinful, you just that's an untouchable. You don't touch that. They don't say that, but that's what it is. They do not stand against all that is evil or all brethren who are in error. They won't touch certain things. But now here we see that we are not to leave these things alone. And moreover, those that just profess to be sound and faithful, that doesn't mean they are. Or one who claims to be a member of the Lord's church, it does not necessarily mean he is a true member. You know, Jesus dealt with this problem of lip service. Well, does Isaiah prophesy of this people saying, they honor me with their lips, they draw nigh to me with their mouth, but their heart is far from me, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines, the commandments of men, Matthew 15, verse 7 to 9. Have you ever known people like that in the religious world or in the church? They profess that they know God. They profess that they're true and faithful. But remember, we know the tree by the fruit it bears. In Titus 1, verse 16, Paul spoke of those who profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work, reprobate fourthly we can know because we can know how to know jesus christ that proves that we can know what a true member of the body of christ is the lord's church the apostle john taught that not only can we know the lord but we can know that we know the lord first john 2 3 and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Can we know the Lord? Yes, we can. Can we know that we know the Lord? Yes, we can, if we keep his commandments. Remember that Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. We see what a great thing it is to know God and Jesus Christ in the prayer of Jesus in John 17, 3. The Lord said, and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. And by the way, where in the Bible is it that it says, I just can't find this, that we can know that we belong to God because of the way we feel. Is that anywhere in there? You know, the wise man warned against this in effect, didn't he? When he said, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Proverbs 14, 12. Proverbs 16, 25, but preacher, you just don't know how good my feelings are. You just don't know how I feel inside. I mean, I've, I've got such a good feeling about my relationship with God. But you know, feelings can be deceiving. And the devil has used man's feelings many times to lead him into sin or to keep him in sin. We might feel good about something, but it'd be totally wrong. Like a pop song that came out several years ago, about an adulterous affair, how can something uh, feel so right and be so wrong? Well, indeed it can. It can feel real right and real good, but destroy your soul in hell forever, my friend. But now, in the fifth place, we need to be able to identify the Lord's church and who are the members thereof in relation to the confused state of the religious world today. We know who a member of the Lord's church is because Jesus Christ plainly states that he, the good shepherd, has one fold, that is, one church. I want to read here from John 10, 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. My friends, I'm afraid many times, although we quote Matthew 16, 18, maybe we don't quote this one enough. Here Jesus is saying there are going to be other sheep that he would bring, that is, other than the Gentiles, or other than the Jews, rather. He would bring in the Gentiles. And there would be one fold. He states there will be only one. Just as he said in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall 
not prevail against it. Now, many times, uh, I don't know if y'all have had people ask you this. I'm sure you have, but uh, uh, what about your church? Or where is your church? I always tell them, well, the Lord's church is located here. And I work with the Central Church of Christ, the Lord's church there. It's not, it's not my church, so I don't answer that question according to their wording. Correct. It gives us an opportunity to teach people what is right. It's not my church, it's not your church, it's the Lord's church. He is the one that built it, Matthew 16 and 18. He is the head and the Savior thereof, Ephesians 5, 23. He loved the church and gave himself up for it, according to Ephesians 5, 25. The church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood, Acts 20, verse 28. And while I'm on that verse, you know, I like to use the King James on that particular teaching, although I believe that one or two others, uh, well, a couple of others are sound, but I like the King James because it's right. The church of God, Jesus is called God there. We need to use that verse to teach the deity of Jesus. The church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. The Lord bought the church with his own blood. The blood bought the church of God, and that's not the church of God denomination, by the way. Is the church of the New Testament. According to Jesus, he knows his sheep, and they know him. In John chapter 10 and verse number 14, I am the good shepherd, and know my sheep, and am known of mine. Then down in verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Many years ago, the story was told of a British man who visited Israel and he went out one day to observe the shepherds with their, all their flocks of sheep out in the field. During the day, the flocks of sheep were mingled together, grazing, but at the end of the day, the shepherd would call his sheep. And without exception, every sheep went to the correct shepherd. Because the shepherd knew his sheep, and they knew his voice. Now, in nature, that's a true thing, that they do know the voice of the shepherd. But spiritually, especially, it is important to know that. Only those who belong to Christ are those who follow only the voice of Jesus Christ. The sects and denominations and factions of men will hear the voice of men. They follow their creed books and their manuals and their leaders in those man-made religious bodies. But only the true sheep will hear only the voice of Jesus. That's why as congregations, as leaders, preachers, and members thereof, we must demand a book, chapter, and verse and a proper understanding of that book, chapter, and verse to prove that whereon we stand and to know what is right according to God's word. But anyway, this man from England who'd gone over there, he asked one of the natives of Israel if it is always the case that the sheep goes to the right shepherd. And he said, well, unless the sheep is sick, unless he is sick. Now I apply that today to the church. We have some sick sheep, don't we? Because they have begun to listen to denominations. They have begun to listen to false teachers in the brotherhood. They not only, they don't just hear the voice of Jesus. In fact, whenever we listen to another, we're not hearing the Lord's voice again anyway. And the only way we can hear the Lord's voice is through the word of God, the Bible. And so remember, if we are sound and healthy and well, we must follow only the voice of Jesus Christ as found in the Word of God. You know, uh, I've got a little more here to go, but uh, I think I'm going to have to... i got how many more is it? We don't really need a break today, no. But I'm going to stop here in just about five minutes. Uh, several, several years ago... Uh, 
I went out to a congregation to try out this congregation to be a pre preacher there. And uh, they welcomed me there, and everybody was nice. And I got, I got up to preach that morning, and there was a racket going on in the room back behind the pulpit. Before the worship started, a, a lady went back there and took a bunch of kids with her. They were having so-called children's church. And whatever they do, it did, it wasn't very uh, orderly because it was loud and noisy and Furthermore, there's no authority to divide the assembly like that. We're all to assemble together when it's time to worship God. Now, when we have Bible classes, that's a different matter. But when we come together for the worship, we're all to be together. We have a lot of congregations today that are practicing that. But anyway, so I preached my sermon that morning. And I thought that afternoon, I said, I'm going to deal with that issue tonight. And I'm probably not going to be asked back. And by the way, I wasn't. So I got up that night, and I dealt with that unscriptural practice of taking the children or young people off into another room out of the assembly. And nobody seemed to get angry. They might have been, though. People don't always say what they think, you know. But you know what else I noticed on Sunday night? The lady that took them back there that morning didn't even come. It makes me wonder if some of these adults don't just don't want to be in the assembly. They'd rather take the kids out and do something. But beside all that, it's not scriptural. We have no authority to do such a thing. So this was pertaining to one of the uh, indication of congregation is sound. They're doing the New Testament acts of worship, singing, praying, preaching, teaching, giving, and partaking of the Lord's Supper. And, uh, you know, I talked a while ago about uh, some people profess to be the Lord's church. Brother Guy in Woods told me the story one time. He got called out to preach in many places, if you ever knew anything about Brother Woods. And uh, he went out to this place to preach, and it was close to the directions that he was given. But part of the sign was covered up. It said, Church of, and he later realized it said, Church of God, instead of Church of Christ. And uh, he went into this place. I believe this is the place that he went in. He did tell me about a place he went in. He went in, and a band uh Trap was set up across the stage. So he just kind of eased out of there. You know, friends, you can tell what the truth is when you know what the Word of God is and when you follow the Word of God. There are many other things we could say, uh, but I want to say this before closing. The church exists to uphold the truth, to spread the truth, to be a godly example, to do good and glorify our Father, which is in heaven, to do the will of the Heavenly Father, and to glorify God. You can do something in the church that you cannot do in man-made organizations, clubs, and civic organizations. You can glorify God. That's the only place. Unto Him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus. Throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Ephesians 3, 21. To God only wise, be glory to Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Romans 16, verse 27. Thank you.